The Characters of Easter podcast with Dan Darling is brought to you by the Life Audio Podcast Network and is part of our Faith Toolkit series. For more inspirational faith-affirming podcasts, visit lifeaudio.com. Hello and welcome again to the Characters of Easter podcast. This is Dan Darling, uh, pastor, uh, author, and speaker. Uh, you can find more information about the characters of Easter if you go to danieldarling.com slash Easter. You can also find the book at your favorite retailer. If you do go to my website, there's a lot of free downloads for your church and group if you want to go through this study uh, during this Easter season. So in this first episode, I want to kind of introduce what I'm doing in the characters of Easter. Um, and first of all, just want to talk about Easter itself and why Easter in 2021 is, I think, going to be even more meaningful than other years. You know, Easter is unlike Christmas in one respect, that it kind of sneaks up on you, uh, particularly if you're in a sort of low church evangelical environment, um, non-liturgical church. Uh, Christmas has become essentially a month, month and a half long celebration, which I love and I'm here for. I mean, I start playing Christmas music like in November without any shame, but we're thinking Christmas thoughts for about six weeks, even two months, maybe. Easter is a little bit different. We're, you know, we're, we're in spring, we're in school, you have spring break, you have all those things. You're kind of rolling along, then all of a sudden it's like, oh, it's Easter. Uh, now, I think that's changing because more and more of us evangelicals are seeing the value of the Lenten season and sort of marking it out um, similarly to the way we do Christmas with Advent. And more and more Christians are really embracing kind of more liturgical uh, style of worship and calendar. But still, for many of us, it sneaks up on us. And so, I, I, but, but I think this year is going to be a little bit different. 2020 was the hardest year of our lives. Uh, there's so much has gone on in the world since the last time we had Easter. The last Easter, many of us, most of us, probably almost all of us around the world, couldn't gather in churches. Um, many churches, I mean, I think all churches uh, in March did live stream worship and I'm grateful for uh, video technology and the way that uh, in this day and age we can use things like Facebook and live streaming so that we can still worship um, together-ish. But there's nothing like gathering with the people of God together, particularly for Good Friday, particularly for Monday Thursday, particularly for Easter that's why I think 2021 will be such a meaningful Easter. Uh, not every church is going to be able to gather in some places where there's more hot spots and some churches where you know people feel less comfortable gathering. They'll still be doing it online. And that's perfectly okay. I mean, uh, the church is not the building. The church is the people. But gathering and being together is important. This is one of the... If there is a silver lining to COVID, and I hesitate to say that because it's been, it's been such a hard pandemic. We've lost so many people. As I'm recording this, we're over 400,000, even just in the United States and a couple million worldwide. Uh, we've lost family and friends to COVID. Um, don't want to minimize it at all. If there's a silver lining, I think it's awakened us in the West to the idea that as good as the digital revolution is, and as wonderful it is to be connected in so many different ways, nothing can replace embodied fellowship, embodied worship really, uh, or just embodied gatherings, all the things we've missed, birthday parties and celebrations and funerals and weddings and PTA meetings and school gatherings and live plays and live concerts. I mean, all those things that we, we so took for granted, I think we long for and hunger. And I think as 2021 unfolds, as things open up more, as the vaccine becomes more uh, widespread and uh, distributed, I think there's going to be a pent-up desire for that in, in the coming months and years. I want to talk about Easter uh, answering the questions of our time. Uh, we've just been through a year with uh, where a deadly virus has made its way around the world, you know, making people sick, causing death and destruction. We've seen really violent racial tensions, 
Uh, we've seen political violence on the left and the right. We saw the siege of the Capitol January 6th that was just so awful, so distressing. Uh, we're, we're in the United States, we're a nation divided so bitterly. I've seen natural disasters kind of rip through our cities and towns. And the world is so broken, so broken. And yet the central message of Easter is that God has come in Jesus to renew and restore a broken world, a new creation. This is why I love that Easter is celebrated in the spring. I love the pastel colors that everybody wears. Why? Because those signal after a long, hard winter. And again, if you're living in Phoenix or Tampa or Southern California, you don't have a long, hard winter. You don't have snow. I'm from the Chicago area. Winters were long and hard and difficult. But for everybody around the world, this has been a long, hard winter. And this is why I like it. Easter is in spring. After a long, hard winter, you're seeing signs of something new coming. Uh, the flowers start to bloom. The grass start to grow green. You see uh, the animals start to come out of their hibernation. That the weather gets a little warmer. There's, there's kind of hope in the air. Just the weather itself. The sun is shining brighter. And this is what the resurrection signals to the world. This is what we're saying on Easter, that after the long, hard winter of a broken world, of a world beset by sin, as, of a world that is so far removed from the world God intended, that Jesus has come to make all things new. Let's talk about the elements of Easter and how they speak to that. I think we have to first talk about the agony of the cross. We don't want to skip ahead too much to Easter before dealing with Good Friday. And Good Friday signifies the height of injustice, the most cruel death a person has ever endured was Jesus' death on the cross. He died at the hands of unruly people, at the hands of a feckless Roman state, at the hands of a really uh, spineless Roman governor in Pilate. As the Bible says, he came into his own and his own received him not. The one who fashioned the world with his hands, the one who breathed life into human beings, was put to death by those very, by his very people. And it wasn't just the physical death and injustice, which is significant, but what he suffered in terms of taking on the sins of the world. You think of the most heinous crimes that have ever been committed. You think of the ugliness of sin having marbled its way through human experience. You think of your feelings about that. And then you think of God's wrath pouring down on Jesus for those crimes and for those sins. You think of how alone Jesus was. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Betrayed and alone. You think Jesus in the garden praying, Lord, take this cup of your cup of wrath from me, and then saying, my will, not my will, but yours be done. Sweating drops of blood. The agony of that cross. And yet, in that moment, Jesus was rectifying and righting all that was wrong. Jesus is finding a way for God's image bearers to find reconciliation with the one who created them. This is Jesus taking on the punishment for the sins of the world. Jesus being alone so you and I would never have to be alone again. Jesus being alone said you and I could be f the friends of God. Jesus being alone so that veil could be torn and we can come boldly to the throne of grace. The agony of that cross, the injustice of that cross, the cruelty of that cross. The cross for us is kind of a symbol today of Christianity. But in those days, it was a hideous symbol of death. It was a violent, gross, 
ignoble way to die. That's Good Friday. And yet, the resurrection tells us that there's something new coming. That Jesus defeated sin and death and the grave. And here's the thing we have to understand about the resurrection. The resurrection doesn't just prove that Jesus is who he says he was. He is who he says he was. He predicted he would suffer an unjust death and he would rise again. It predicted that he was not just a would-be Messiah, but that he is the Son of God. But the resurrection is so much more than that. The resurrection is the death of death. When Paul says, oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? Jesus defeated death. Think about it. The death that worms its way into human hearts. The death that takes people due to COVID. The death that takes people due to murder and violence. The death of our souls. The death of our relationships. The resurrection says that death is dead. Death was not part of the original plan. Death is a distortion of our humanity. The resurrection also means that Jesus not only can save our souls and redeem us from hell, and redeem us from God's wrath, but he also saves our bodies. Romans reminds us that the whole world, the creation, groans in anticipation of its renewal. And you don't have to look very far around the world to see just how torn up and broken it is. 2020 told us that. And yet the resurrection tells us there's a new creation coming. There's something new coming for the world, something new coming for our bodies the bodies in which we suffer, the bodies that are wracked by disease and pain. This is Paul's whole apologetic in 1 Corinthians 15 and in Thessalonians where he's talking about the struggle and the hardship and and life in this body, but the resurrection means that there's a new world and a new day coming out. Let me tell you something, my friends. There's been times so dark when I look around and say, like, I don't know where to put my hope, but if you believe the resurrection, there's a new world coming. That's what Easter is. And this is a message the world needs, especially today, especially in this moment. And so we can, we can share this message with the world. One of the things I like to tell people on Easter, that if you're coming to Easter and you're not a believer, and there's a lot of cynicism out there about religion, about, even about Christianity, I want to tell, you, tell people, just strip away all the trappings and all the things that you think you, you think about Christianity and just say that, Ask yourself, is the resurrection true? And I urge you to look at all the evidence. Folks like N.T. Wright and Lee Strobel and Sean McDowell and others have written wonderful apologetics proving that really the resurrection, there's so much proof. There's 500 witnesses there. Um, There's so many different layers of that. But what I want to say to people is, if this is true, everything changes. If you don't believe the resurrection is true, then you'll wish it was true. Because we need something like this. Someone and something has to come and save the world. Our political parties aren't going to renew and restore the world. The great movements won't renew and restore the world. Our great corporations, our great science will not renew and restore the world. We need something. So those of us who are believers or Christians... Everything we do, everything we work for hinges on this central fact that Jesus Christ rose from the grave. And as Paul says, if he didn't, it is us religious people who are of all to be pitied. Why are we doing this if it's not true? But if it is, it changes everything. So man, I invite you into the story of Easter. One of the things I want to do in the characters of Easter is take a peek behind all these people who appear on the pages of the Gospels as figures in the greatest story ever told. People like Peter and John, who are just young men who follow this itinerant rabbi. People like Judas, who was a gospel preacher who ended up betraying his Lord. People like Pilate, who are stuck and thrust into a position of leadership at a moment in history with competing voices in their head, who think they're they're putting Jesus on trial, but when really they're on trial before the Almighty and the women who are the first witnesses to the tomb, the first to tell the story. Will you join me for this wonderful journey through the characters of Easter? If you'd like more information about the book, 
you can go to danieldarling.com slash Easter. The Characters of Easter podcast is a production of Life Audio and the Salem Web Network. We hope you'll also check out Dan Darling's book, The Characters of Easter, The Villains, Heroes, Cowards, and Crooks Who Witnessed History's Biggest Miracle. It's available from Moody Publishers on Amazon.com or wherever you buy your books. You can find more from Dan and all his latest books and podcasts by visiting danieldarling.com. If you liked what you just listened to, would you just take a second and tell your friends about us? Maybe leave us a rating on your favorite podcast app? This podcast is produced by Kelly Givens and Stephen Sanders with editorial oversight provided by me, Stephen McGarvey. To find more great Christian podcasts like this, check out the rest of our shows at lifeaudio.com.